Welcome, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser coming to you live from Fort Myers, Florida here at Caring Medical. Appreciate you guys watching these videos. Obviously, most of you are watching a video on intracranial hypertension and internal jugular vein compression are probably doing it because nobody's figured out the cause of your problem. It's kind of like to discover something, you need to know what you're looking for. So if somebody doesn't look for a drainage of the brain problem, you're not gonna find it. Like even to figure out whether a person's internal jugular vein is getting compressed, you have to have a high degree of suspicion. Well, the first thing you need to know is that the drainage of the brain all goes uh, through the neck and most of it is from the veins. So in other words, some of the brain drains through the lymph system. That's why when we do ultrasounds of people's necks, we often find that there's lymph adenopathy or large lymph nodes, not from infection, but engorgement from basically the, I mean, you know, I tend to call it brain poop, but it's basically the waste products of all the neuron activity. So imagine there's one billion neurons in the brain that are active, especially with cell phones. Do you think there's a lot of waste products or neuron poop? There's a lot of neuron poop. 94% of people, the main drainage port of the brain is through the internal jugular vein, at least in one study, and 6% was through the vertebral veins and other collateral veins. So that's why we emphasize the internal jugular vein. You can even look here, see how much bigger the internal jugular vein is than the other veins, and then ultimately it drains to the veins that go to the heart, and then of course the body detoxifies it in the liver and different other places and then cleans it up and then it basically recycles, right? That's what's supposed to happen in the human body. Like we recycle the fluids. Uh, and then when the fluid levels get low, what do we do? We get thirsty, then we drink, which increases the fluid flow. So let's look at what happens when you have internal jugular vein compression and how can you document it? Look at this, this is the internal jugular vein. It's going into the jugular foramen, which is right by this, the, basically the atlas and the occiput. So this is the C1, this is the C1 vertebrae, and you can see that the jugular vein runs right in front of the lateral mass of C1. So if you have a forward head posture, if you have a forward head posture, the atlas is gonna go forward and it can compress the carotid artery or the jugular vein. So the number one cause of internal jugular vein compression is the lateral mass of C1. Another bony impediment to the internal jugular vein can be an elongated styloid. An elongated styloid, we can see it on digital motion x-ray, which is the scanning technique we use in the office to document cervical instability and the structure of the human neck. But also you can see it by a CT venogram. There are medical conditions which obstruction of the internal jugular vein have been found to various degrees. So look at all these. We, the one I talk about mostly is idiopath or intracranial hypertension, brain stem compression, glaucoma, Alzheimer's, dementia, POTS, you know, all are associated with internal jugular vein compression. So it's a very, very serious problem when it exists because it means the brain can't drain good, the pressure in the brain is going to get higher, and then the pressure in the brain can cause what? Can cause damage to various brain structures leading to what? Problems in the autonomic nervous system, problems with the eye, problems with memory, you know, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis symptoms, or at least exas exacerbation of the symptoms. You guys know this is Ed, right? So Ed. <clears throat> so the structure here is the carotid sheath. So if somebody had a really big bone spur in the front here, that could cause obstruction of the internal jugular vein. Uh, uh, so a really large osteophyte, and you can see that by lateral C-spine x-ray. Obviously, if somebody had where the cervical curve was destroyed, 
which we call cervical destructure that can cause obstruction of the internal and jugular vein. Uh, if you have cervical instability, then with every head motion, you could the vertebrae could be hitting and obstructing the internal and jugular vein. There's, we talked about an elongated styloid. So in Ed, this is the styloid. So there are times where the styloid becomes very elongated and compresses the internal jugular vein. There's muscles like the digastric muscle that, no, that can obstruct the internal jugular vein when there's excessive protrusion. And there's people that they work on the computer all day long and they're in this position, then the posterior uh, belly of the digastric then can then start compressing the internal jugular vein as well as subluxations of the vertebrae, other muscles, and even uh, you know thoracic outlet syndrome indirectly can obstruct flow in the internal jugular vein. And what I, the danger of it is is when you get obstruction of there, the basically the brain toilet, in other words, the waste products that are occurring all the time in the brain uh, can't get out of the brain. So what's gonna happen to the brain when there's increased pressure in the brain and there's waste products? The brain's just sitting in basically neuron poop or dirty, sludgy fluid. It's not gonna function very good. That's why brain fog is so common when you get obstruction of the internal jugular vein. It's getting more and more percentage of the patients that I see that brain function is really, really bad, and then you often get a depression with it. So if you have head pressure, you may have other symptoms, but you also just have like a malaise about you, and you can't explain it, it's probably this. You probably have obstruction of the internal jugular vein causing what I call brain toilet obstruction. And that's why when you lay down, the jugular vein tends to open more and then you feel better. So if this seems to apply to you, the easy thing you can do right now before you get an assessment is just lay down for five minutes every hour and then hopefully the brain will drain and you'll get rid of some of this and then obviously feel better. Sometimes I order, we order at Caring Medical CT venograms. You can see here where the person has slight compression. See how it's very dilated, the internal jugular vein here and then you could see where it's thinner there, so the person's getting compression in the upper cervical region of their internal jugular vein. Then the question is, what's causing that? There's two main causes. One is that instead of the person's spine being like this, it's like this, like it's forward. So in other words, every time the atlas goes forward, it has the potential to compress the internal jugular vein. And of course, when you have upper cervical instability with every head motion, in other words, if a person has instability at C1, C2, atlantoaxial instability, then every time they turn their head, the atlas can move more and then they can get intermittent compression of the internal jugular vein. There's a lot of non-invasive tests for internal jugular vein compression. We do motion ultrasounds. So we do ultrasounds in the supine position, in the upright position with different motions to show that the jugular vein's closing. Uh, you can do transcranial Doppler. So what happens is with transcranial Doppler, when you have jugular vein compression, pressure increases in the brain, then when we look at the arteries in the brain. There can be dilation of the arteries with a really increase in blood flow. And then you can also document that the pressure inside the brain's high by what's called the pulsatility index. It's basically how distensible is the artery. You can do MRCT venograms, so that, that does that is a little bit invasive in the sense that you have to use contrast. So you have to use a little bit of contrast. And then that, and you saw one of the venograms, that was a 3D reconstruction, which showed we could move that, we could move that so I could see the 3D configuration and see that the lateral mass of C1 was compressing that internal jugular vein. We, this is really interesting too, so um, the, you want to figure out um, 
is internal jugular vein compression causing a symptom? Well, in the office, because we have ultrasound, we can actually put an ultrasound probe here and an ultrasound probe here and compress the internal jugular vein, which would increase the pressure and see if the symptoms increase. For instance, if somebody had migraine headaches and you wondered, is it associated with the jugular vein, you could compress the jugular veins, which increases the pressure in the head and see if it induces a migraine or makes a person's vision worse, uh, gives them a headache, you know, things like that. So that's what that is. And we can do uh, ultrasound of the eye and you can even see dilatation of the ophthalmic veins. Obviously, if there's increased pressure in the, uh, in the brain, that pressure is gonna ultimately decrease CSF flow, which is manifested by uh, increase in the optic nerve sheath diameter. I know I do a lot, a lot of videos on internal jugular vein compression, but it does cause a lot of things. So if you have the signs or symptoms compatible with intracranial hypertension, some vision problems, head pressure, nausea, what I would recommend is get an evaluation. We evaluate, you know, we do these measurements, see if there's cervical dysstructure, cervical instability, and then lay out a plan to resolve that.